Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll give everyone about a minute to uh, to get seated and get ready to go, and then uh, we can't wait to get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan Anderson, and I'm the uh, general manager for the Center for Entrepreneurship at Mohawk College. It's a it's a brand new entity that we have at the college, uh, and we are really excited to to come together today for the start of our mental health week sessions. Um, today, we're going to focus on mental health in the workplace and for business leaders. Uh, very excited to, to to start this, and I want to talk a few a little bit now about the why and why this is so important to us. Uh, it's a it's a I feel a hidden secret among entrepreneurs. Uh, I, I was one, I was a business leader, um, still am a leader of our, of our school right now. And, and I feel that, that this is something that, that we often have ignored. And this is something that, that, that I'm, gl I'm glad that we can bring to, to you, the students, and our community to, to sort of take the lid off of, of something that I feel is very important to all of us. Um, some stats I'd like to show with you. Uh, the, in June of 2019, the Canadian Mental Health Association did a study of entrepreneurs and, and found some very interesting results. Uh, I'll share with you now. Number one, 62% felt depressed at least once a week. Those, those are entrepreneurs. Uh, number two, uh, nearly half, 46%, said that mental health issues interfere with their ability to work. And we'll talk a little bit today uh, about my experiences as well as, as, as some of the things that may come to come about in the workplace. Uh, and, and last but not least, one in five, 21% of entrepreneurs feel satisfied with their mental health less than once a week. So that means that 80% of the time people are battling these things. Um, now let's talk a little bit about, about what COVID has done. Uh, you know, mental health issues were always present. They're always ominous among, among all entrepreneurs. COVID really has exasperated that. We now have entrepreneurs that are more worried about how to maintain their business, how to stay afloat, than grow their business. And this only has accentuated mental health problems. Um, a little bit about, about some of the things that I dealt with, and this is, this is the first time I've talked about this openly. Um, you know, I was an entrepreneur. I was a business leader. I come from a family of entrepreneurs. And, and I used to say always that in my house, Dinner time was one that I knew it was a good day or a bad day. If, if it was a good day for entrepreneurs uh, and, and for my father at the time, it was a nice dinner. If it was a bad day, a bad day, dinner was sometimes quiet, tense. You would walk around. I found myself with my own family doing the same thing sometimes and needing to be quiet, needing to go for a walk, uh, indigestion, uh, headaches, being short with my children sometimes. And this is something that I started to realize maybe this is also some of the challenges that I'm dealing with too. As an entrepreneur working in the workplace, sometimes you feel you don't have time to deal with stress. You don't have time to deal with some of the things that, that might be impacting you. Uh, I started to see it in myself before I actually knew. I was tired quite a bit. I was eating the wrong things. Uh, I was short-tempered at times, which, which I never am. I was impatient. Uh, my heart would race sometimes. My chest would be tight. I wouldn't know why that was. I often was getting colds and hanging and, 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 and not feeling fantastic. I'd have headaches all the time. I'd often skip meals, but then I would overeat afterwards. Um, I was inconsistent sometimes in how I dealt with employees. I, I often would be sometimes very patient, sometimes not, uh, and that was impacting quite a bit. They will often say that 80% of employees leave because of their bosses. And, and if I'm not well, if I'm not able to go in and, and, and help my employees, well, now retention or attrition can, can become a problem as well. You know, my, my way of dealing really sometimes was a bottle of Advil in the left-hand corner of my desk. Uh, was sometimes going for a walk when I felt that way. I learned to cope a little bit, but I didn't learn to fix it. I didn't learn to help myself out. Um, I didn't know the impact until September of, of two years ago when I was sitting here and actually feeling really good. I was sitting in my office feeling great, thinking, wow, I'm really good today. That told me, and I started to wonder, why am I always evaluating that? Why am I always not sure about how I feel? Uh, I then started to sweat. My chest started to get very heavy. I started to feel like I was going to throw up. Um, and before long, 10 minutes later, I was in, I was at the hospital and they thought that I was, I had chest issues or whatever it may have been. They sat me down and they went and they said that you were perfectly fine. You were very healthy, but you were mentally sick. They told me I had anxiety. They told me that I had been stressed for many, many years. They started going through a lot of the, of the 
symptoms, a lot of the things that I had, and I kept nodding my head. And I kept saying, yep, that's me. Yep, that's me. I realized really quickly that this has had something that had caught up with me. They said, likely I've been dealing with this for many, many years and that I had ignored it by dealing with coping strategies, whether that be walking or the Advil or just ignoring these things. I realized then the impact it was having on my life. I realized that it was the impact it was having on my workplace and most importantly on me and my family. And it was time to, to really address it, be open and start to, look to, to make challenges and, and some changes I had. Um, I've done it. We still deal with it. I still deal with it. Um, but this is something that, that this is why this has become a project for me that is very important for entrepreneurs and very important for our students to also take a look at too. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our experts today. Uh, I'm really excited to have Nick Petrella from Mohawk College and Jill Dennison uh, from the Canadian Mental Health Association to talk today about the impact that we have in the workplace and mental health. So with that, I will turn it over to Jill and to Nick. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you guys so much for having us today. Um, my name is Jill Dennison. I work for the Canadian Mental Health Association in Hamilton. My title is Mental Health Promotion and Resiliency Facilitator. So basically what that means is I teach and I talk about mental health. Um, before the pandemic started, um, I in, was an instructor teaching a couple of different things, mental health first aid, um, which Nick is also a um, uh, instructor with. I also teach ASSIST, which is Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. I also teach SAFE Talk, which stands for Suicide Alertness for Everyone. And I also teach a program called Mental Health Works, which some of you may be interested in. And it's designed to specifically look at mental health in the workplace. So I was very excited when I got the invitation today. Um, so I am going to be showing you a presentation. Um, let's see, maybe. Okay. So we are going to be looking at a, a few things, and then I'm actually going to turn it over to Nick. So it's one of those things that I think is really important is that we really focus on the understanding for the need for hope and healing when we're talking about mental health. So whenever I do a presentation, one of the things I always start with is having people understand the difference between mental health and mental illness, because there is a huge difference. So when I say the term mental health, what I'm referring to is something that everybody experiences. Absolutely everybody. If you have a brain, you have mental health. It literally is that simple. You have a body, so you have physical health, but, and so does everybody. But it's funny because for centuries, we didn't look at it that way. When we heard that term mental health, we always went to something was wrong. But when we talk about the term physical health, we know we know that that means when we know that that means that it can be anything it could be things that are going well it could also be things that aren't going well and that's the really important thing to remember is that when we use that term health we mean everything we mean the good we mean the bad we mean the in between and when we hear those terms like positive mental health or positive mental well-being what we're referring to is having a balance in life and figuring out for yourself what that balance is and what's interesting about that is everybody's balance is unique and different. And think, different things affect people's balance and it changes all the time. Think about your day, think about a day where you woke up and things just did not start off well, right? So your mental health may not be optimum right at that moment, but it can definitely change as the day goes on or vice versa. Maybe your day started out great and then something happened that sent it off the rails. So that is your mental health, that up, that down, that backwards, that sideways. And it's really important that we understand that when we talk about mental health, it's that it's interchangeable with physical health. And Ryan mentioned that when he mentioned having physical symptoms, but it was something going on with his mental health. They're absolutely interconnected. Your brain controls your entire body. So why wouldn't they be? And why can't something go wrong? Just like it came with our physical health. And why can't we look at what to do about it? So that's basically mental health. So what I often get is the question, so what is mental illness then? So mental illness is a general term that refers to a group of illnesses and disorders of the brain. So this is, affects how people think, how they feel, their sensations, their perceptions, and even their behaviors. And often that's where some of this stigma comes in. So mental illness for the most part are chemical imbalances that occur in the brain. They're not a choice, they're not an option. Somebody just doesn't wake up one day and go, oh, 
saying, I'll try depression today. I've never had that before. It's an illness that is occurring. There are other illnesses too, and I'm going to touch on those that are trauma related. Um, and those can have some of the same things, but these aren't something somebody chose. So we have to remember that when we're thinking about, especially about mental illness in the workplace. The one thing mental illness is not, is not contagious. You can't catch it by being kind. And the reason I show this is it's really important to be um, kind and appreciative of anybody's journey, whether there's a diagnosis or not, because everybody can be dealing with cha different challenges. And Ryan mentioned this pandemic. We are definitely in a di different situation than we were. And this began, you know, almost a year ago now we've been dealing with this. And a lot of people, you've probably heard that saying, we're all in the same boat. I don't believe that. I believe we're all kind of in the same pandemic ocean together. But what's really in interesting is we're all in different boats. And some of our boats are really good. And some of our boats are really well equipped with things to manage things. But some days, even the most well equipped boats can be coming upon wave upon wave upon wave and having difficulty managing. So it's really important that we understand that anybody can be in a different place than we are. And it's really important that we be kind no matter what our interactions are. So what are some of the stats? So this comes from CMHA's eighth annual report on healthcare. And what it is, is one in 10 people think of mental, somebody with a mental illness can just snap out of it. So that means they believe that it's not even real. And that's one in nine think depression is not a real, is not a mental illness or even a real medical illness. And what we need to understand is you can't snap out of a broken leg. You can't snap out of having diabetes. So why do we use that terminology when we think about somebody who's dealing with a mental illness? And one in half of our population don't even think that mental, that depression is serious when actually it can actually lead to death. But we do know that 60% of Canadians feel like the diagnosis and treatment of mental illness is underfunded. And when the stats are that one in four people will experience a mental illness in a year, that's important that we start changing those things, that we really start looking at funding our mental illness, mental illness treatment the same way we do other illnesses, okay? So these are just a few of the different types of mental illnesses that exist. There's anxiety disorders, there's mood disorders, there's eating disorders, there's psychotic disorders, personality disorders, and substance use disorders. But what's interesting about mental illness is you don't have you can have a diagnosis, but still experience symptoms from another mental illness. And it's important that we don't always focus on the, the label or the diagnosis, especially when it comes to helping people, because really what we're trying to do is help somebody who's going through something and that really doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. So that's what kind of leads us to talking about stigma. And that's why we do a lot of this work. Um, so stigma is the negative and prejudicial ways in which people living with mental illness are labeled. And it often means that being labeled is sometimes worse than the disease itself. I've heard that from a lot of people. And what we have to remember is labels are for jars. They're not for people. It's really important that we understand that stigma is the number one reason that actually stops people from getting help. But there's three different types of stigma. There's that self-stigma that comes from within. And that's can't be me, can't be happening to me. I can't possibly have a mental illness. Um, you heard it from Ryan, you know, it wasn't something that was is on people's radar because it doesn't happen to people like me, we often think. And that self stigma is actually perpetuated by what we call community or social stigma. And that's that stigma that comes from within. Um, from, from within, that's um, self stigma is from within, but the social and community stigma is comes from external factors. And for history, we have thought of mental illness in a certain way. And we thought of it very negatively. And so because society did that, it perpetuated that self stigma. There's a third type of stigma and that's family stigma. And that's a stigma that can definitely have an effect on whether families reach out for a loved one to get help or whether they reach out for themselves to get help while they're caring for a loved one. And it also has a big sense of guilt attached to it and shame that, you know, this can't be happening to my family. And when those things are in place, that's when we stop and, and don't get help. One of the other big places that we see stigma is in the workplace. And this is this strong attitude and something that Bell Let's Talk has really been working on is really changing our attitudes in the workplace around 
the importance of understanding that mental health and mental illness are equally important and that we need to start recognizing that. And a lot of the work that I do and my colleagues do is we spend some time in workplaces discussing this and how we can really start to adjust that. And it's really interesting, especially when you heard, you know, Ryan talk about it and you're going to hear Nick talk about it, those connections between our physical and mental. But often we don't even think about it that way. So I'm actually going to stop talking. I'm going to turn this over to Nick and um, have Nick share a bit of his experiences. So the, the screen is going to shift here, and I believe it's going to open up a PowerPoint, which I feel like some of you are probably familiar with. Um, I am new to this technology, so please bear with me here it's, uh, as, I, as I try and figure it out. So um, first of all, thanks, Jill, for the, the awesome opening, and, and thank you, Ryan, for um, organi organizing this and putting it all together. Um, today is more about just bringing up awareness and, and reducing stigma than anything. And, and how do we do that, right? And, and I think what the one message that I want you to take away from today is that each of us, every single one of us has the ability to do something um, every minute of every day, or even just one thing a day. It doesn't have to be every minute of every day, but we have the ability to, to do something every day in order to save a life because it's truly that simple. Um, I know a lot of you on here have heard my presentation before and, and heard um, my journey. Um, and I think one of the, the things I, I do want to say is that no matter how many times I share it, I think that uh, people take different messages away. So I'm going to share parts of it again. Um, and then we'll, we'll finish off with the, the take home kind of message for the day. But, um, you know, my, my journey with mental health, um, you know, like Jill said, it, it's been my whole life, but I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what mental health was. I didn't know what mental illness was. I didn't know what anxiety and depression were. Um, I was diagnosed with severe depression and severe anxiety over 10 years ago now. And when I was diagnosed, uh, that literally, I had no idea what that meant, right? I had no idea what, what depression was. I had no idea what anxiety was. And, you know, I actually had to go and, and use the Google machine to figure that out and, and to do a little bit of reading on what those things are. And it was shocking and, and overwhelming in that time. You know, a lot of times when we go to a doctor and, and, you know, for example, you get injured, you go to a doctor and there's a plan, right? So, you know, you, you have this wrong with you, but here's what we're going to do to make it better. Here's what we're going to do to, you know, the medication we can prescribe. Here's the, you know, the therapy process, the physiotherapy process, the rehabilitation, whatever it might be. Well, the scary part about mental health and, and mental illness is there really isn't a concrete process of, of what's going to work for everybody. And when I was diagnosed, it sent me spiraling out of control and spiraling in a way that um, I struggled every minute of every day for the next five or six years. And I was trying, find, trying to find reasons not to kill myself. You know, I was struggling with, with suicide and feeling like a burden and feeling like I was less of a person and less of a man. And I had become so ashamed and disgusted with myself that I was literally crying uncontrollably most days. You know, the, the interesting part about that whole process was that I, was, I wasn't telling people what was going on, right? I wasn't sharing that information, but I was still going to work. I was doing my job. I was still exercising every day. Um, you know, I was married at that time. Um, my, 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 ex, my now ex-wife had no idea what, was, what, what I was experiencing because I, wasn't, I didn't even know what it was. I didn't know how to explain it. So I would literally just cry and I would wake up every morning just trying to keep my head afloat and just trying to, to literally get out of bed and make it through another day and truly just make it through the next minute. And that's one of the lessons I think I've learned over time is that, you know, mental health or mental illness, it's a, it's a journey that you have to focus on minute by minute. My diagnosis, like I said, it, it sent me spiraling and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who to turn to. So my, my solution at the time was, oh, I'll just shut everybody out. I'll just stop talking to people. And if I stop talking to people, then maybe nobody will actually know what's going on and I'll be able to figure this out. And I ended up, you know, going to see a therapist and, and um, you know, my, my best friend at the time, a professor at the college who all of you know is now, um, is now my wife and my best friend, Chantal. She was very kind and, and very persistent and very consistent. And she was truly a rock that, that I wish everybody had because she was, 
even not knowing what was going on, she was trying to help me get better and not even knowing what to do, but she was just trying to be there for me. And I saw a dozen different therapists, you know, and, and a dozen different, you know, mental health professionals, social workers, social support workers, anybody, any counselor that would talk to me. I was reading self-help books. I was on the internet. I was watching videos on YouTube. I was doing anything I could because even though I had felt, I felt like I was so broken and I had felt like I was so weak and literally that my life was ending, even though I was having all of these feelings, I wasn't satisfied. I, I wasn't, you know, I just wanted to, to do anything I could as well. And I, I didn't want to give up. You know, I didn't want to quit. I didn't want to stop. So I kept trying to find ways. And some of the most difficult and, and challenging experiences I had were in therapy. And I don't tell you that to scare you away from therapy. I tell you this from the, the objective of it takes many, many falls and you have to fall and crumble many times before you can build yourself back up and stand up and be strong again. And I remember I had given up on therapy. Um, I'd stopped therapy entirely because I was, I, people were telling me I was broken. I was too far gone. Um, I, they didn't have the time to fix me or didn't know how to fix me. Um, the therapist that actually diagnosed me was the one that told me I was broken and that she didn't know what to do with me anymore. Those were the things I was being told. The point is this, I had finally reached a point where I was broken and I felt broken and I'd given up. And Chantel again was there and said, essentially, I'm not going to stop bothering you until you make a therapy appointment. I'm not going to stop texting and calling. I'm not going to stop emailing until you prove to me that you're going back to therapy. And that was probably the most important thing that I ever did. And, you know, and I know she knows this, the most important thing she ever did because she truly saved my life in that moment. And in that moment, I went home, I looked up, you know, therapists in, in London, Ontario, because that's where I was living. And that's when I started to scroll through some names and some pictures and some bios. And I truly was just looking at photos and I clicked on a photo of a woman that I thought looked like a nice person. And because her photo was appealing to me, I sent her an email and we connected via email and I went in to see her. I think it was the next week. And I still see that therapist to this day. Um, I, I, you know, I, I took time off, which I will get into, but I, I still see that therapist to this day. And she truly has been the one therapist that I found that I was able to connect with. And it's a relationship like you have with a partner or a spouse. You don't necessarily, not everybody marries the first person that they date. Not everybody dates the first person they meet. You don't end up spending a life with somebody that you liked in, in, you know, in elementary school, right? It doesn't work like that. And therapy is the same way. And that's what I learned from that experience is that I went to a dozen different therapists to find the right one, to find what I actually needed, to find what I, what I actually, what was going to benefit me. So I finally had found a person that I was willing or was willing to, to help me and was able to connect with me in a way that I needed to be connected with. And I remember leaving her office for the very first time. Um, I remember just walking out of her office and, you know, I was very stubborn and, and not in a very good place emotionally. And I remember her basically just saying, um, can we agree not to agree right now, but maybe that maybe that there is help available for you. And, or, and she being that help, right? And I remember walking out and, and our therapy sessions to this day still end the same way. She will tell a joke and make everybody laugh. And that's how therapy ends. And, and then it's, here's what we're gonna do for next time. Here's your homework type thing. And I remember her making me laugh in some way. And I remember for the first time, I felt a little bit better about who I was. And it was because she was able to explain to me that who I am isn't what I thought I was, right? Who I am is, is not my depression, is not my anxiety. I also have um, PTSD and I also have panic disorder. Those are two things that, that as well don't define me, but those are things I have to live with. And that's the day I truly believed that my recovery journey started. And I was literally working every day to become a little bit more selfish. And that, when I say selfish, I truly mean that because I had to spend time every day work myself because if i didn't work on myself then i wasn't going to be good for somebody else i wasn't going to be what i needed to be for other people you know and i was still working at the college i was still teaching classes i was still you know going through all of these parts of life where i thought you know i that i thought i needed to do but at the same time i wasn't able to achieve anything i wanted simply because i was being so held back with where, where i was emotionally and where i was um, just in, in terms of my own mental health and that balance. And balance is something that, again, 
taking years and years and years for me to even understand what that means, not even achieve it. Because I don't know if any of us actually ever achieve balance. It's a it's an ongoing process that we learn from every day when we wake up and, and go through the steps of life, right? But just understanding what balance actually meant and understanding that in order for myself to feel like I'm balanced, I need to do certain things every day. I need to, and it's almost like I have a checklist where I need to exercise every day. I need to, um, I need to be express gratitude, which is something I've learned that I have to do on a daily basis because it, it, it selfishly, it makes me feel better. I have to communicate openly and honestly with people around me. I have to communicate about my mental health and my struggles with mental health. I have to communicate about my journey. I have to also eat, you know, and, and, and not just eat well, but just eat in general. I have to focus on sleep. I have to be surrounded with people that I know are there for me for the right reasons. These are all things that I've learned are part of my balance. But again, it's taken me, you know, almost 12 years to, to get to a point where I understand that I need those things, you know. You know, I fast forward to a couple of years ago, almost to the day. And, um, you know, I had thought, so two years ago, I thought I, I had had my mental health under control. I thought I was emotionally well. I thought I was conquering um, depression. I thought I was conquering anxiety. I thought, you know what, I was, I, I, we had a, a second daughter. Um, you know, I, we were building this, this family and life together that we had always dreamed about and we talked about over and over and over again. And it was at that point where um, I realized that I had been, I was lying to myself. I was lying to myself. I was lying to the people that loved me. I was pretending that I was something I, that I wasn't. You know, I quickly realized that I was not in control of my mental health and I was not in control of my emotional wellness. In fact, it was directly controlling me. It was owning me and I didn't even realize it was happening because I had stopped focusing on the things that I needed on a daily basis. I had stopped focusing on being honest and communicating. And in turn, I was hurting so many people around me. And two years ago to this day, I had a really severe relapse. You know, I was back in a place where I never thought I would be. I was back into a deep, dark hole, literally just trying to find my way back out just to get some light and, and some air back into my lungs. And two years ago, I started the process of recovery again. And the reason I tell you that story is because your mental health changes over and over and over again. And the second that you stop focusing on yourself, the second that you stop taking care of yourself, the second that I stop taking care of myself, I know that my depression, my anxiety is going to start to take control of me again. And I will no longer be in control because I have also learned that I truly do have some control. And the control I have is doing the little things every day that I need to do in order to be better for, for my wife, in order to be better for my family, in order for, to be better for my students, to be better at, at my job, to be better for just people in general. Because again, if I'm not taking care of myself, if you're not taking care of yourself, then there's a really, really good chance that your emotional health is going to be out of balance. And that doesn't mean that you're going to have depression. It doesn't mean you're going to have anxiety or schizophrenia or a mood disorder or a personality disorder. That's not what I'm saying. There's obviously a risk and there's a possibility, but just because you're not taking care of yourself doesn't mean that's going to happen. But there is a possibility that it can. But by being, by not taking care of yourself, by not being in balance, then ultimately you could be out of balance. And when you're out of balance, you can't take care of anybody else. You can't be there for anybody else. You can't help anybody else. You can't be kind. You can't be non-judgmental. You can't be patient. You can't be resilient if you're not taking care of yourself. And these are all skills and things that we can do day in and day out, not only to help ourselves, but to help other people. This is a really, really um, important week. You know, Bell Let's Talk Day obviously coming up on Thursday. Whereas the one day a year where the nation, the, the Canada focuses specifically on mental health, is that enough? No, of course that's not enough, but it's a start because maybe it engages people that weren't comfortable being engaged before. Maybe on Bell Let's Talk Day this year, you reach out to somebody for the first time ever. Why? Because it's inspired by a specific day. So is that day enough? Of course not, but it's a start. And it's a start in the right direction where we're going to get to a point where those conversations spill over into other days. I remember the very first time, and I've shared this story thousands of times. I remember the very first time I gave a presentation 
And it was in Chantel's class again. And, um, you know, there was a big lead up to this because she asked me to come in and talk about mental health, knowing a little bit about what I was going through, but not a lot. Um, but she wanted to, to, to you know, engage me in, in a way that I hadn't before. And I remember her asking me to come in and I remember saying, absolutely not. I'm not talking about mental health in front of anybody ever. I said, because you'll still see right through me. They're going to think I'm crazy. You know, they're going to think that, that I don't deserve to work at the college, that I've lost my mind. You know, if I share anything about my mental health, they're going to look, you know, look down on me, basically. I remember having that conversation with her and she said, well, why don't you just come in and then you can maybe just answer questions about mental health and physical health and the connection or nutrition and, and mental health or something like that. And her, I'm saying, no, nope, definitely not. There's still a risk that somebody's going to see through me and I'm not okay with that. Anyways, somehow I ended up in that classroom and I had no intention of doing what I did that day. And for about probably 90 minutes, I think, and it was a Mohawk college class. It was wellness management. The very first time I spoke in that class for you Mohawk students that, that are in the audience right now. Um, I remember standing up in that classroom and for 90 minutes, I basically just cried. And I cried sharing this story, but in a lot more detail, with a lot less insight as well. Because one of the other things I've learned over the years is every time I do one of these presentations, I learn something else about myself. Anyways, I'm standing in that room, and I finish the presentation, and I'm literally just standing there, and I don't know what's next. What's going to happen next, right? What, what's the next step? And are they going to, am I going to get fired? Um, are people going to laugh? Are people going to run? You know, what happens? And I remember standing there and one by one, slowly students started to come up and they started to thank me and, and show gratitude for, for me being open and vulnerable and honest. And I remember starting to feel that weight lift off my shoulders. And I remember starting to feel again, a little bit more acceptable, accepted, maybe accepted or a little more comfortable with who I was. And I tell you this story because two days later, and this is where we're going with this conversation, two days later, I received an email from one of those students. And the email was basically saying, you know, I'm not going to be in class anymore. I just wanted to say thank you for, for being a mentor. Um, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to get to know you, but you're not going to see me in class anymore. And I remember I, something just didn't sit right, and my gut just didn't feel good about what was said. So I replied to him right away, and we exchanged emails for the next so, you know, three, four hours. And I remember um, all of a sudden it came out in, in one of the, the following emails that his initial email to me was his suicide letter and he was saying goodbye. Um, and he didn't know who else to turn to. He didn't know, he didn't have anybody else to turn to, frankly. He had reached a point in his life where he was living in his car. He was attending classes at Mohawk, but he was living in his car in the parking lot. Um, he would shower in the change rooms and, and that was his life. And he was basically in so much pain, he didn't know what else to do. And the next morning, uh, Monday morning, I met him at Mohawk and, and Chantal was with me. And it turns out that we, uh, we were able to help him. Um, he just needed somebody to care. He needed somebody to say, I care and I'm gonna help. I didn't give him any advice. I didn't tell him what to do or what he needed to do or what I think he should, he should do. I didn't say anything like that. All I did was I say, I don't know what to do, but I care and I wanna help you in any way I can. And that's all he truly needed to save his life. He needed somebody to just let him know that they care enough that they're not gonna turn their back. And I cared enough that I wasn't gonna tell him how to fix it. I cared enough that I wasn't judging him for what he was going through. I cared enough that I was going to help him find somewhere to live. I cared enough that I was gonna meet him the next morning to help him get things back on track. And the point I'm trying to make here is that all it took was for me to admit that I cared. And that's something that each and every one of you can do on a daily basis. If you simply just be caring and kind and compassionate to those around you, and rather than offer advice, rather than tell somebody how to fix it, rather than tell somebody how to make it better, by simply just caring and listening, you can save a life. And you all have it in you. The, the scary part is most of us, we're not taught how to listen. We're not taught how to, to um, sit across from somebody and not give advice, right? Because our, our instinct is, well, I want to help. So I'm going to tell you what to do. I'll tell you what I would do, right? Or you're not, you know, I can tell you're sad. So let me try and tell you different things to make you feel better. Well, in reality, you know, I, I've, from my own experience, when I'm not doing well, there is nothing that anybody can say to make me feel better. 
There's no compliment you can give me to change how I'm feeling. When I'm in a, in a difficult emotional place, all I need is for somebody to be there. I just need somebody to sit with me. I need somebody to say, how can I help? And not tell me how to fix it, not tell me what I should or shouldn't do, but just be there and listen if I'm willing to talk. And most of the times I don't need somebody to listen. And most people don't need somebody to listen. They need somebody to weather the storm with them. They need somebody to hold on to while they're being overrun with waves and, and tornadoes and hurricanes and all of these different emotions that are swirling around their brain and their body. They just need somebody to be there and weather it with them. Because it's always better when you're not alone. It's always better when you have somebody that's willing to weather that storm with you, that's willing to go through it with you and not fix it. And that's the direction we're going now. You know, I, I, I could literally talk for hours about my, my mental health journey and I have so many stories, so many that, I, that I've forgotten about um, that come up once in a while when I'm doing these presentations. But I wanna get into some of the most important parts and that's not only taking care of ourselves, but taking care of each other. And Bell Let's Talk Day, we're turning it into Bell Let's Talk Week. Hopefully it becomes an annual year round, 365 day a year, a 24 hour day, seven day a week type of, of world that we're living in. But we're trying to get to the point where how do we not only take care of ourselves, how do we take care of other people? And I'm sure that you've all um, hopefully seen some of the Bell Let's Talk commercials that are out this year. And it's about how every action counts, how every little thing you do makes a difference how every little thing that you don't do makes a difference. And that includes sometimes when you're allowing, not even when you're allowing, sometimes when judgment is, is overrunning your brain, right? Because we're all judgmental. Every single, one, every single one of us is judgmental. We are, we can't control that. That's how our brain works. We can't control the fact that we judge every second of every day. In fact, that's how we form all of our opinions. Our initial instinct is to judge. So the next time when you feel that judgment kind of forming your opinion for you, take a step back and don't allow that judgment to make the decision. Think through what the actual situation is. Start to process the information around the situation. And what I mean by that is start to ask some questions. Start to ask questions about perhaps, what can I do, right? Maybe I don't understand what's going on and that's okay too. Maybe I don't understand, but that's okay. But I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to try. And that's where I wanna to start to have the conversation for the next 10, 15 minutes around what can you do? Because yes, we have to take care of ourselves. We absolutely have to take care of ourselves, take care of ourselves, because if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of anybody else. So what that means for everybody is different. I told you what it means for me. For me, it means exercise, it means communication. It means being open and honest, not just with myself, but with, but with Chantel. I have to be open and honest because if I'm not, then I'm not being, then I'm not taking care of myself. I have to exercise, I have to eat well, I have to be, in order to be a better father for our daughters and our, and our three fur children, in order to be a better dad for all of them, I have to take care of myself first. So you have to take care of yourself first. But once you start taking care of yourself, or, or even if you're starting or thinking about taking care of yourself, this is where the rest of that applies because we all, have the ability to fix, not fix, change, impact. That's the word I was looking for. Impact someone else's day, impact someone else's mood, impact someone else, what somebody else thinks and feels. Because no matter what, no matter what, people will always, and for those, for those of you that have heard me, uh, Mohawk students out there, you're like, oh, he's gonna say it again. People will never remember what you say. People will never remember the words you use. They might remember some of the tone of voice, but they're always, always, always going to remember how you make them feel. And how you make them feel is based on a couple of different things. One of them is listening. One of them is asking questions. One of them is just being kind and compassionate. And yes, this is um, this series that we're putting on this week is about entrepreneurs and, and businesses. So it's important to recognize that this not only occurs in, in schools and, and, and at your house, but it's occurring everywhere. So what, are we, what can we do about it, right? What can we do? What can you do? What can I do, right? And I think the most important step, and I keep mentioning this, and Jill, please feel free to jump in at any point, um, and, and also questions or, or, or 
or um, any interaction we appreciate as well is try not to judge, right? And, and it's okay to judge because we all do it, right? We all do it. But when you're judging or being judgmental, the best part or the best thing you can do is take a step back. Take a step back from that judgment and then ask a question, right? Because judgment decided whether you like this platform or not. Judgment decided whether you like Ryan, for those of you that don't know Ryan, you judge whether you liked him or not based on the first time he started speaking. You did. Why? Because that's how our brain works. So now what do we do? Well, maybe we take a step back from that judgment and say, well, maybe Ryan, you know, or maybe Nick didn't mean to do that, right? Or, or you know, Nick was kind of, uh, didn't make eye contact with me today when he said hi, that showed me that he didn't care. Well, maybe Nick didn't mean to do that. Maybe Nick was focused on something else. We don't know what other people are experiencing. We don't know what's going on in their lives until we ask. And in order to ask, that doesn't take, it's not therapy, right? It's not therapy when we ask questions. And then when we ask questions, the most important thing that we often forget to do is listen, right? And we all know somebody who asks a question only so that they can tell you their opinion or their side of it, right? And we all have a friend that wants to, that, that texts you or, or calls you every Monday morning and says, how was your weekend? But then as soon as you start to share about your weekend, they cut you off and say, well, my weekend was awesome. You know, I watched the football game and, you know, I, the, the Buccaneers won and, you know, that Brady's awesome. And, and all of you are thinking, but, well, you didn't even hear what I had to say. You didn't, you didn't even hear that my weekend was terrible, right? You didn't hear that I had this terrible experience this weekend because you didn't take the time to listen. And listening is not talking. I'll say that again because sometimes we forget. Listening is not talking. Listening is asking questions. And listening is saying, you know, I don't know what that's like. Or I don't know how that feels. Tell me about it. Or, or if you don't want to tell me about it, are you okay if I ask some more questions to try to understand? Right? Because we all know what emotions are. You've all been angry. You've all been sad. You've all been frustrated. You've all been overwhelmed. Um, you know, you list all these different emotions. We all feel them every day, right? They're not going anywhere. We all feel them. So try to relate to the emotion, right? So if you know what angry is and somebody's experiencing anger, it doesn't matter how they got there. It doesn't matter why they're angry. It's that they're angry, right? So how did you get there? Okay, maybe maybe we can talk about that, but we don't have to talk about that. But being angry is something we can all understand. And I'm sorry you feel that way, right? And that's what listening is. It's asking questions and it's allowing there to be some silence. And I think that's something that most people are uncomfortable with. You know, and, and I'm sharing this and, and I know Jill's gonna jump in as well to add in in a couple of seconds here, a couple of minutes, but I'm sharing this from the perspective of the support person where if I'm trying to be there for somebody, I have to be okay with it being quiet and somebody not knowing what to say. Right. And allowing that silence to happen because that might be them processing emotion. Right. Now, think about this. Think about the most the most the, the biggest secret that you have in your life, something that you haven't shared with with barely anybody. And imagine getting to a point where you were about to be to be vulnerable and share that with somebody. And then they just started talking. You're not likely going to share that with them again. You've lost. They've lost that opportunity to learn from you, to hear from you. So when there's silence and somebody is processing information or emotion, allow that to happen. Allow that to happen. Listen to understand, not to reply. Listen to understand and not to reply. And the biggest piece of advice that I think that, 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 that you should take home from this is that listening involves kindness. And kindness is just remembering that everybody has a different perspective. Everybody has a different journey. Everybody has a different experience. Two people can experience the exact same thing. One person is gonna process it differently than other. Somebody else, kindness is recognizing that your opinion isn't the only opinion. Kindness is recognizing that there's different perspectives to every situation, right? And that's where we start to build up that empathy. And uh, Jill, I'm gonna steal something that you taught me years ago. And that was simply that Empathy isn't walking a mile in somebody else's shoes. That's not what empathy is, right? If somebody walked a mile in a pair of shoes, if you want to understand what empathy is, if you want to express empathy, ask them how they felt during the mile 
ask them about the challenges they had during the mile because that pair of shoes might not be the right pair of shoes for them. So empathy is asking questions and not passing judgment. Empathy is remembering that everybody has a different path than yours and that basically they may have a different experience than you did and that's okay. And that's absolutely okay. But that's ultimately what empathy is. And I think I'm gonna uh, leave this screen up for a while because I think this is an important one to, to focus on. Um, and the last thing I wanna say before I, I turn it back over to Joe because I feel like I'm starting to ramble as I always do. Uh, I'm gonna share a story uh, that, that between Jill and I that happened years ago. And um, so I, I went through a divorce, oh, I don't even know how many years ago now, it had to be six, seven years ago, I guess. Um, I, went, I was going through a divorce and it, the divorce was, was um, compassionate, it wasn't terrible. Uh, we just decided that, that obviously our relationship wasn't where we wanted it to be. She honestly, she did not know how to deal with my mental health. Um, I didn't even know how to deal with my mental health and it had torn us apart in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, I was in the middle of a divorce and I was doing a presentation with, with Jill and I hadn't slept for probably five, six days, you know, maybe an hour or two here or there at the most. And I was not able to make eye contact with anybody. You know, I, I you know, Jill will tell you my presentation was fine. She said it was great at that day, but I, I just wasn't presenting well. I wasn't flowing well. You know, I was obviously, you know, not sleeping. Imagine what that does to you, right? And I remember walking out um, of the presentation with Jill and, and she said, well, uh, how did you feel that went? And I said, you know, it didn't go well. And, and she said, well, why? And I said, you know, I just, it didn't go well. And she said, well, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Because everybody, when, when you ask somebody if they're okay, their answer is, yeah, I'm fine. And then she stopped me and, and uh, remember she basically turned me around and, and faced me and made eye contact with me and said, no, really, are you okay? And I remember I just started to, to tear up. I started to cry and I said, no, I'm not. And the reason I tell you that story is because everybody's going to tell you they're okay until you have that connection with them, whether it be eye contact or, or physical connection or, or some sort of shared energy until you have that experience where somebody can actually see into your eyes and see that you're not okay. They're going to tell you they're fine. And I broke down and I said, I'm not okay. And we had a long conversation and obviously I felt better after. But the point of this is that you have to have that, that, that interaction. You have to have that eye contact. You have to be able to see through the fact that they're gonna say they're fine to see their energy, to see their body language, to see how uncomfortable they actually are answering that question. So my homework for you before we open up for discussion and, and I let Jill speak as I promised I would, um, is, is to reach out to somebody. And I see your, your, um, your question here, Jordan, um, with COVID and lockdowns as well, it's, it's making it challenging. Um, but I will say the last thing I'm gonna say is that everybody's health is priority. And lockdown or not, if you're worried about somebody, if you're worried about somebody, you have to check on them. You have to check on them. And my homework for you as always is to check in on somebody today check in and see if they're okay. And if they say they're fine, follow up and say, well, I'm worried. Is there anything I can do to help? Because that's all it takes to save a life. Um, I'm going to stop talking right there. I'm going to pull up a screen of resources. And I do want, and if Jill, if you want to talk about the bounce back program as well, uh, before people go, because I think that's a valuable um, program that people are not taking advantage of. Um, but again, thank you everybody for listening. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, if there are any questions, obviously we're happy to answer them. I'm happy to answer anything I can. My contact info, you all, it's all on the, been on the screen the whole time, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but Jill, if you wanna talk about resources while questions come in, that would be awesome. But thank you everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank, thanks, Nick, that was amazing. Um, I always, every time I, I mean, you and I have done this a lot together, but I always take something different away. Um, so I think it's really important that we understand some of our resources in our, our community. Um, one of the resources that's fantastic that Nick has up on the screen here is called Bounce Back. So Bounce Back is a CMHA product and it's available for free um, and it's out, done over the phone and it's available to anybody over the age of 15. It's a cognitive behavioral therapy um, program and it actually uses, utilizes a coach. 
So there is no wait list. You can self-refer. You can do the, your own referral online. It takes about five to 10 business days, and then you'll get connected with a coach. There's 20 different modules that you can work through, but you don't have to do all 20. If you did, it would take about three months, um, but you could do two, you could do five, you could do 12. You get to pick and choose the modules that kind of are important to you. And it is a, um, a learning tool. So it really is about learning some skills to help people navigate when things aren't going well. Um, and it really is a really good resource. And um, it is something that Bell Let's Talk has funded and that actually the government has actually put some more funding into this. Um, so it's all done over the phone and it's all done kind of based on your own schedule too. So there are some nighttime appointments and you work with the same coach from beginning to end. So it's not like you have to have a new person every single time. It's also really important to understand that there's resources in your community. And if you don't know what those resources are, 211.ca is a great resource. It's a website that you can type in where you live and what you're looking for. So if you're looking for mental health or substance use supports, you can type that in and it'll give it to you. Um, so it's really, really important that um, we access resources. You can also call your local CMHA. So Canadian Mental Health Association, while we do offer intensive case management, we are honest about the fact that there is a wait list for that. But every day we have somebody who is available to talk to you from 8 to 4.30 in Hamilton. And other CMHAs also have that. Um, and Nick put up some more. So there's some a lot of different resources here. And if you ever want to just visit our website, you could do that as well. We have a list of resources on our website as well. It's the other thing is, and I think Nick mentioned this too at the beginning, is that sometimes it takes a bit of a process to find the resource that's going to work for you. So it's okay if something didn't, um, and it's okay to reach out again to something else. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it back over to Brian in case there's some other questions that maybe we haven't um, hit yet. Just a word to our to our group before we, we do field some questions. Um, we are going to post uh, the PowerPoints and the links on our Center for Entrepreneurship website, so you'll see them there. Uh, the presentation will also be will be available on our YouTube channel as well. So uh, a couple of questions, and Nick, Jill, maybe maybe you know you can field these questions. There are some business related ones that I can certainly help with as well. Um, first thing here. Um, a couple have asked about the stigma, about the stigma both in the workplace and for entrepreneurs, and they, they've, they're wondering why. So why is that stigma? Why is it hard for entrepreneurs to, to talk about this? Um, I'd be happy to share my thoughts, um, and then what I'll do is I'll pass it off to, to you and Nick. Um, I think when you're an entrepreneur, you're, it's the biggest, biggest leadership job you have, and leadership is the, one of the biggest acting jobs that someone has. And if you're not okay, the last thing you want to do is portray that weakness to somebody else. There is a sense of uh, bravado within the entrepreneurship uh, community as well that, that uh, if, you, if you look like you're weak, whether that be mentally, physically, whatever it is, uh, there is that sign that, that potentially that business is not doing as well. And so I know I can talk about that stigma. It was always very important for me not to admit that I was not feeling my greatest. Um, and I know that's something that is often in the workplace as well. Uh, Jill, Nick, would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think so. State, I mean, for businesses or for entrepreneurs or, or employees, um, I think the important thing to remember is that, that mental illness doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter who you are, where you work, how much money you make, um, your culture, your background, your race, your, you know, how good your parents are, you know, how good your, your, your wife is or, or your spouse. Um, it doesn't discriminate. It affects everybody the same. So the stigma doesn't, you know, the types of stigma don't change. Um, just because somebody's more successful than somebody else, in fact, that it's even greater in situations where, um, where where somebody is possibly deemed more successful, right? So I, I think the important thing to remember is that it doesn't matter who you are. In, in the stat is one in four people will experience mental illness. We know it's closer to one in three. Um, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't care about who you are. It, it's mm -hmm. it's a fact of, of life and very much like cancer and diabetes and, and all the physical illnesses we discussed, um, they can happen to anybody at any point. And the part that we have to remember is that if we don't make or create this environment where it's okay to talk about it, if we don't create that environment, then the chances are that one of, you know, you lose somebody close to you at some point in your life as a result of it. And that's the, the, the harsh reality of it is that, you know, all the stats that we see with suicide, um, 
you know, eventually at some point in our lives, somebody close to us or that we know um, may take their own life if we don't create that environment because suicide is mostly preventable if we are willing to talk about it. And, and to add to that, it's also that historical piece, right? For centuries, we didn't talk about mental illness. We didn't talk about mental health. We didn't talk about any of it. And if it was happening in your community or in your workplace or in your business or in your school, we didn't talk about it. When Nick and I started going into schools many, many years ago, it was a little bit like deer in headlights. So we, we're starting to see a shift. We're starting to see some understanding now, but it still takes a lot. And part of the work that we do is teaching about the psychological health and safety standards that are now uh, a government recommendation. So it's not something that businesses can avoid anymore. It's something that we legitimately need to recognize. But it's, it's taken a lot of time and we still have a ways to go. Jill, I'd offer as well that I, I think there's also a generational challenge with this too. Um, I had some business colleagues of mine that, you know, when I shared some of the struggles that I had, um, you know, one of the gentlemen who is in his late fifties went and said, wow, I've had a headache now for 20 years and I go home every night and, you know, and I don't know why I'm feeling so tired or beat down or so I had, you know, my temper is up and down. And, and it, there's that sort of me too stage of this thing as well that, that I know that I, I, I encountered in the business community. Um, another question that came from us too is, you know, how does this impact someone's performance at work? Um, Nick, you and I have talked a lot about, about the ups and downs. And I know, you know, you were mentioning the emotional side of going to work and not being well. Could you sort of dive in a little bit to that? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, so the, the part that I think, you know, and something that I learn more about every day is that um, your body and your brain are, are one unit. It's one, it's one well-oiled machine that's supposed to work together. And, um, you know, you can't have mental health without physical health you can't have physical health without mental health. And if you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed emotionally, um, over time that emo the stress is stress, whether it be you know physical or, or emotional, it's going to impact the entire body. And being overwhelmed emotionally is eventually going to take its toll physically and your body will start to break down as well. And maybe break down injury, pain, you know, chronic pain, something you experience every minute of every day, or it, it could be something that turns into disease, right? And, and we're seeing, you know, it's not, it's not easy to prove that there's a connection between, you know, poor emotional health and um, the incidence of, you know, for example, cancer or something like that. But, you know, it, it's, not, it's not very far-fetched to see or understand or believe that how your brain is dealing with trauma and stress is going to impact your body. And eventually that's going to lead to, to poor performance in, in any part of your life. I mean, if you look at the brain of somebody who's overwhelmed under, you know, different types of scans, it's very easy to see that the norm, normal healthy brain versus the overwhelmed stressed brain, um, you know, they're entirely different. And, and the way that it fires and works is, is entirely different. So poor or, or ign maybe not poor, let's say ignored emotional health, ignored brain health, is ultimately going to lead to poor physical health in one way or another. I, I think too, you know, Nick, the, 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 you, know, you and I have talked about this. The deeper I try to dive into what was technically wrong with me being a, being new to this, the the more mentally I had challenges. And so, you know, you know, you always die. You know, the Google doctors and diving in on all these different things, and and you can convince yourself you've got a lot more things going on than just your mental health problems as well. And I found that, you know. The biggest learning for me was the relationship between your physical and mental health and how those things break with each other. And that was a, a big learning experience. I know, I know on my end. And as I've spoken to other business leaders, they, you know, we've really kind of taken a step back. The other thing is knowing that when it comes to anxiety, I was shocked that there are so many physical things that this can impact that you never knew about. And every, you know, every day there were more things. And I think that's something in speaking to business leaders, I, I know a lot have mentioned to me as well. So um, I think, I think one last question that's come here that I find a, a very interesting one. And I, in some of the comments I'm seeing here, a lot of these, I think will, will come up to more when we talk about the impact on employees in the business. Um, a question that was asked, do, 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 do any, do you both feel that enough is being done by businesses right now to to examine and look at mental health issues that that I, that's a very good question um i think it depends i think it's we we're seeing change which is great 
So the program that we offer, the one program that we offer mental health works, which actually goes into the workplace. We talk to managers and supervisors. It, the, it's been around for almost 15 years, which is really interesting, but we just started offering it um, about a couple of years ago. And what we're seeing is, yes, the big businesses want it, but so do, we're seeing a lot more uptake from smaller, more family run who, and sometimes that's just because you have a closeness with your employees, right? You see them every day, you have that interaction. Um, but we are seeing change start to happen, which is pretty awesome. Um, some of the webinars that we're, we've been running, what we're seeing is people um, from businesses who want to know more. Now, the 13 psychological health and safety standards, it's really interesting, even though businesses don't know that they exist, but they're expected to. So they're really, and I think too, the other thing comes down to it is a lot of, um business owners think well it, now all the kind of all the gifts it, it's so much employees have it so easy now i'm not allowed to um correct somebody's behavior or anything like that and it's really not about that it's about educating people around the health component and how that there is a back and forth right there's a responsibility for the employer but there's a responsibility for the employee too it doesn't it's not a lot of people think it's just oh this is just something new and it's going to pass it's not. We know, as Nick said, we know that connection between physical and mental, and we really, really have to kind of learn more about it, take the time, and it is an investment. Just like you train your staff in CPR um, and regular first aid and WMIS and all of those things, um, learning things like mental health first aid and mental health works, really, really an investment in your company. You know, Jill, it's, it's interesting when you said that because I know as, you know, my, in my former life, working within a business, you, whenever you looked at training, you, you have always had to measure return on investment. And was this going to be a cost for the workplace or was this going to be an investment for the workplace? Um, I know whenever I was approached about mental health training, I I didn't wasn't in tune enough and I don't think a lot of business owners are in tune enough with what the impact is. I didn't know that my attendance numbers, for example, or my attrition, employees leaving were really a big, a big, a big systemic problem with this. I saw this as more of a more of a cost and not an investment. I know that's something that, that I think we all need to work hard at changing as well. So uh, a lot of good questions that I, I know what we're going to, I know tomorrow we're speaking a lot about mental health within the workplace of, for employees. And uh, I'm seeing here some fantastic comments uh, based on that. I'm going to make note of these and make sure that these comments are, are asked. These questions are, are, are answered directly in tomorrow's session. Um, Jill, Nick, I, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, to the people that attended, uh, the feedback here has been fantastic. We please ask you to fill out our, our, um, our evaluation because we'd love to know. Um, Jill, Nick, I appreciate your time so much. Uh, tomorrow we'll get together again at noon and we're going to dive in a lot into the actual workplace, into what the employees are suffering right now and really talk a lot about the stigma on that side too. And then Friday, uh, I'm really excited to learn more about the mental health first aid program. And, and, and Jill, I wish this was available when I had my business because it would have been a game changer for us. So um, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, have a fantastic day and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow.